years ago, uh, my wife and I decided it would be a good idea to take our family uh, all the way up to South Dakota uh, and, and take one of those long road trips. And so we spent 5,000 miles in a van with four kids ranging in age from 13 down to two. All right, brilliant idea. We actually did have a good time. Uh, but when all the traveling, we, the farthest we made it was Mount Rushmore. Any of you guys ever been to Mount Rushmore? It's fascinating, right? Isn't that neat? So we get to Mount Rushmore, and, and we're, we're taking the tour. And uh, if you've ever been there, they have a really neat, uh, like, walking uh, track that you follow. And uh, there's, there's places where the, the way they cut the trees is you can only see, like, one face of the president and, uh, and then they'll, there's all kinds of stuff there about that particular president. It's really, really well done. And so we spend the day there. And uh, <clears throat> as it happened, one of my children uh, had a birthday on that very day we were there. And so finally, I guess this precious child couldn't contain it any longer. But about halfway through the day, uh, they turn to us and say, Are you kidding me? I cannot believe you took me to school on my birthday. Because that's what it was. You learn about the presidents all day. All right? They were not thrilled. But in all that time we were at Mount Rushmore, uh, one of the things, you know, you do different, like you watch a movie and you, you see all the displays and you read about the thing. And, and it always talked about a designer and the sculptor and what he did and how long it took for this team of however many people uh, to sculpt, you know, four presidential faces out of a mountain. At no time during that day did I hear anybody say, wow, look at this. Can you believe how long it took for the wind and the rain and the erosion to create these faces out of this mountain? Isn't that amazing? I didn't hear that once all day long. In fact, if y'all would put that picture up. If you've never been there, this is, this is what it looks like, right? It, it's pretty obvious that somebody came along. And they designed this, and they sculpted it, and, and they did the work, right? And one of the things that really gives us that clue is that we know who these four faces are. If you know your American history and you look up at this mountain, you know that that's uh, for the, the presidents in our history, okay? Now, show that next picture for me if you would, okay? So this is another uh, somewhat famous mountain, not quite as famous as Mount Rushmore, but this is the White Mountain in New Hampshire. And this particular mountain, this is a formation that's called the Man in the Mountain, okay? And in fact, it's not there anymore because time and wind and erosion has knocked off the, that facing there. But if you look at it and you use your imagination a little bit, what do you see in, in there? Kind of looks like a, the profile of a man, right? Okay, it's called the man in the mountain. All right. But I'm imagining at no point when somebody goes to visit this particular mountain, I'm imagining there, there never comes a point where somebody says, can you believe how long it took these designers and these sculptors to work on this mountain to make it look like a profile? Why not? It's pretty obvious this is just a natural formation. It just kind of looks like a man if you use your imagination a little bit. <clears throat> and so today, I want to look, you know, the Bible tells us about these sort of things. I want to look at Psalm 19. We're going to look at the first six verses, and we're going to find out how we can have confidence in God as creator. Because God's, the Bible tells us God speaks to us in two different ways. The first way he speaks to us is something the theologians would call general revelation. And general revelation is the understanding we have of who God is from nature. I can remember as a kid growing up, my parents' favorite place to vacation, in fact, it still is their favorite place to vacation, is in Gallenberg, Tennessee. And, and I can remember, inevitably, every time we'd be on, the, on a hiking trail or we'd be going through the national park, my dad would stop and say, I can't believe anybody would think there's not a God. Look how beautiful this is. And that's part of it. But general revelation is the understanding that there is a God. Okay, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But the second part, that the way God speaks to us is called special revelation. And that is God speaking to us through the Bible, through the life of Christ. And that is um, how God speaks to us in a more specific way. So in other words, general revelation tells us there is a God. And special revelation tells us what God is like. And so today we're going to learn that there is a God and why we can have confidence that there is a God, not just something 
uh, that, that we think is, is a neat idea or not something we've grown up with, but that we can have confidence that there is, in fact, a creator who created us and that there is God. When I was in college, uh, I used to ride uh, back and forth from Tallahassee to Panama City uh, with a guy on my dorm floor. He was, our, he was a guy I'd actually uh, gone to high school with, and I gave him a ride uh, on the weekends that we decided to go home. And he didn't believe there was a God. And at the age of 19, I did not have any answers for him when he said there was no God. I had no evidence. I had no uh, logical uh, way to tell him, yes, there is a God. All I could say was, I just believe there's God. And, one, and those conversations prompted me at the time to start finding out, is there evidence that there is a God, or is that just something uh, we, we believe in with, without any proof? And so today we're going to talk about that you can believe there is God, that there is evidence, that there is proof. So let's start in Psalm 19, 1 through 6. It says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky proclaims the work of His hands. Day after day they pour out speech, night after night they communicate knowledge. There is no speech, there are no words, their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a groom crumbing, coming from the bridal chamber. It rejoices like an athlete running its course. And it rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other end. Nothing is hidden from its heat. Let's go ahead and pray before we get started today, all right? Father God, I ask you to bless the reading of your word. I ask you to make it clear to us and help us to understand that you alone are almighty God. And you alone are our creator and that you love us. And I pray as we walk out of here today, Lord, that your name will be great and will be glorified. Amen. So here's, here's what we need to understand from this passage. Let's start here. We have no excuse for unbelief. All right? We have no excuse to say there is no God. All right? Let's read that verse again. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims the work of his hands. In other words, there is an innate understanding in us that there is God. The Bible says, and uh, as you'll see in a second, reality of nature bears it out that we were created. There is a God. There is something beyond what we can sense, and there's something beyond time and space. All right? Christians, we would call it God. Okay? And so there is no excuse for unbelief. Ecclesiastes uh, 4 actually puts it this way. It says, uh, for he has put eternity into the hearts of men. So deep down, we know there must be something beyond us. We know there must be something beyond this life. Okay? Romans 1, 19 through 20, here's how it says it. It says, what can be known about God is evident among them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen since the creation of the world. Being understand through what he has made, and as a result, People are without excuse. So the Bible tells us we have an innate sense that there is something beyond us, that there is God. And so we have a choice. We can either suppress that knowledge or we can accept that knowledge. Okay? In fact, in Romans 1.25, uh, he goes on to say, and I believe this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. It says, For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and they worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. So please understand, we are going to worship something. We are going to serve something. The question is, what or who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve that which was created, or are we going to serve that which is the creator? All right? And so nature tells us there is a creator. Are we going to exchange that truth for a lie? One question that also often comes up. In fact, I I teach ninth grade at at our uh, Christian school. And we used to do something called Question Friday, where the, the students could ask any question they wanted to. And I would... Uh, either answer it, try to answer it, or tell them I don't know, all right? Because sometimes they stump you. But one question I always got every year without fail was a question of what happens to people who have never heard about Jesus, okay? These verses give us the first part of that answer, and here's what that, that answer is. If you would, imagine for me uh, that you were in dire straits financially, and you owed $2,000 on your mortgage, And if you didn't get that $2,000, you were going to eventually be uh, evicted out of your home. And so you start calling your friends. You start calling acquaintances. You start calling anybody you can think of that might help you with this $2,000. And so you call a friend, and he says, you know what? I don't have $2,000. I'm so sorry, but I do have $500. Would you like $500? What's What's the answer there? 
Of course I do. Thank you so much. I'm so appreciative. Now, could you imagine if he, you know, he calls you back. He says, I've got $500. You say, you moron. I said I needed $2,000. I don't want your $500. Get out of here. All right? Is, is that, there's a word for that. You know what it is? Stupid. That's right. Somebody said it over here. Thank you. All right? So, my point in that is, we have the first part. We have the $500, so to speak. God has made it clear to us that there is a creator. And so we can either accept that, that knowledge, we can accept the $500, so to speak, or we can say, no, I don't want it. Okay? So God's given us the first half of what is important to understand. And so from that point, if you have rejected that there is God, then you've rejected it and there's no need to go further. Is everybody clear? Everybody understand what I'm saying? And from that point, then, you are now ready to understand about Christ. And so we'll, we'll talk about what happens if you live in one of those, those areas in the world where uh, the name of Jesus has not been heard. But we will get to that. But I want you to understand the first part. You have the first half. You have the $500, so to speak. All right. Uh, there's a guy named Alex McFarlane. He's a, a Christian speaker, a Christian author. Uh, I, I like following him. And he tells a story of uh, going to India, as a, you know, doing some mission work there. And, and he was in a village. And um, so what would happen is they, they, they put out the word all around the area uh, that there's a Christian missionary uh, in this particular village in India. And so people are coming from all over the place. And so one day they wake up, and there's this guy walking into the village with a cow on a rope. And uh, they, they start to get his story. And he says, yep, I walked eight hours from my village to here. And I, I had to bring my cow with me because he might get stolen while I was gone. So a guy walks eight hours with a cow because he wants to hear this Christian missionary. And he says, here's why I want to hear it. He says, I look around and I know there must be a God. There must be something beyond us. But I have no idea what it is. And when I heard there's a Christian missionary, I thought maybe he can give me the answer. And so he walks eight hours to find that. Okay? He had the first part. He had the $500, so to speak. So we have no excuse for unbelief. God has made it clear to us. The question is, will we suppress that truth or will we accept that truth? Here's number two, verse two, three, and four. Day after day, they pour out speech. Night after night, they communicate knowledge. There's no speech. There are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. In other words, they're not talking. They're not telling you about it, but their, their voice is loud because you can see that there must be God. Um, you hear this all the time, or at least I hear it all the time in the, in the things I read, in the circles I run, in the things I watch. All right? This idea that if you are a Christian, you must not believe uh, in science. Uh, there's a famous debate years ago uh, between Ken Ham and Bill Nye the science guy. All right? And in that debate, the question was, if you believe in God, will you, will you hurt scientific progress? And Bill Nye's, uh, his response was, yes, we can't have science if you believe in God. And Ken Ham's uh, answer was, yes, we can have science if we believe in God. And, and it, was, it was a good debate. It was very interesting. But uh, here's the understanding. The, that mindset of Bill Nye was, if you believe in God, you don't believe in science because you believe in, in something you have no proof for. All right? Let me tell you today, I want to give you three evidences, three proofs that there is in fact a creator, there is in fact God. Okay? Here's the first one. It's the declaration of the universe. All right? You're going to feel like you're back in science class for just a second, but, but bear with me. Okay? The declaration of the universe is what's called the cosmological argument. Okay? Cosmological argument. All right? In other words, it, it means logic from the world. Okay. Cosmological argument says this. It says, whatever begins to, I'm sorry, the universe began to exist. Okay. In other words, there was a starting point to everything being created. Okay. Um, science confirms this for us, by the way. We know the universe is expanding outward, and very simply, that means at some point it had to be inward into one beginning point. Okay, so the universe is, is expanding outward. The universe had a beginning. The second part of this says, uh, everything that has a beginning must have had a cause. Okay? In other words, if something begins, something had to cause that. We know instinctively nothing appears out of thin air. Right? 
This is not, this is not rocket science. We know this. We've never observed things that appear out of thin air. Okay? We know if something happens, if something exists, something must have caused it. So the universe began to exist. We know everything that begins must have a cause. And then the third part says this cause, or therefore, uh, this cause must be eternal, outside time and space, and personal, because the universe must have a cause. Okay? In other words, because of all these three things, all right, the universe had something that caused it. Something must have created the universe. Okay? Uh, back in the 60s and 70s, uh, long before um, or at least people began to take the, the evidence seriously, uh, most people believed, or most scientists, I would say, believed that the universe was eternal. It had always been. But science tells us something different, that it did have a beginning. So that beginning must be something outside time and space. And uh, while somebody who doesn't know Christ might say, okay, but we as Christians would say that is God. Okay, that's what would fit there. Declaration of the universe. Second one is called the declaration of our world. Okay, the scientific word for that is called the anthropic principle. If you want to feel really smart to your friends later, use that phrase, the anthropic principle. But the, this, this says that our universe is uniquely designed for life. It's uniquely designed for life to exist. It's uniquely designed, designed for that same life uh, to examine the universe itself. There are around a hundred what they would call constants. A okay? hundred constants that have to be at a certain point for us to exist on this earth. Things like uh, the, the force of gravity must be at a, a certain uh, certain force, so to speak. The relation of the moon to the sun must be at a certain point for us to exist. Um, the crust of the earth has to be a certain thickness or we could not exist on that. The presence of tectonic plates in the earth must be there or we could not exist on this earth. Those go on and on and on. Like I said, there's about a hundred. And so uh, the mathematicians, the guys who are really smart about this kind of stuff, would say the odds of that happening by chance are simply astronomical. In fact, let me give you an example. All right. If we uh, today got in a helicopter and we started to fly over the state of Texas, and let's say somebody came along and they filled the state of Texas with silver dollars three feet deep. All right. Can you picture that with me? The entire state of Texas, silver dollars three feet deep. Okay. I've driven across the state of Texas. That's big. Okay. Now, I'm in that helicopter, and somebody drops me out of that helicopter at a random point somewhere in Texas, and I'm blindfolded. What are the odds that I would come down and I would pick up a silver dollar that had been marked with the letter A on it? Only one out of all those silver dollars marked with the letter A. That's, that's astronomical, right? Okay. That example doesn't even begin to come close to the odds of our universe being randomly formed the way it has to be for us to live on this earth. Okay? It is astronomical odds, and that speaks to there must have been a designer. All right. There's a famous astronomer named Robert Jastrow. Uh, he said something I thought was very profound. He says, uh, for centuries, people have been trying to find out uh, what the earth was like. How did the earth get here? What happened? He said they climbed the mountain of skepticism. They climbed the mountain of science. And when they get there, they find a band of theologians who've been sitting, sitting there for centuries. In other words, if you're willing to look at the evidence, you're going to find it in Almighty God. So we have the declaration of the universe. We have the declaration of our world. But then there's another evidence of God. This is called the declaration of morality. All right, declaration of morality. If you understand, the, the word morality simply means this is the way I think you should act. All right? Morality can be good. Morality can be bad. In fact, everybody has what we would call a moral code. Adolf Hitler had a moral code. Now, we would find that code abhorrent, but he had a way he thought you should live. Okay? But morality says instinctively we know the difference between right and wrong. Okay? We don't always show it. We may, as a child, not, not bear that out. But as we grow, we know that there's a difference of right and wrong. Okay? And one of the reasons we know this is because this general standard of right and wrong is the same across all cultures, across all times, and across all peoples. All right? Generally speaking, murder is wrong. And no one would dispute that. 
Okay, some people would, granted, but the vast majority of people would not dispute that. And in fact, the way we know for sure it's wrong is if somebody came up to you with a gun and said, I, at this point, I'd like to, to kill you, all right, you're probably going to not, you're probably not going to say, oh, well, I understand that's your standard of right and wrong, okay. We're not going to do that, right? We know it's wrong because it's happening to us. There's a moral code. In fact, the Bible says God wrote, uh, he writes his words on our heart. He gives us the understanding of a standard right and wrong. And so when I say there's uh, the declaration of morality, we cannot get away from it. And let me give you a a historical example that will show us uh, that there is a standard of right and wrong. At the end of World War II, the world had a serious problem, and here's what it was. They had defeated uh, the nation of Germany. If you're familiar with your World War II history, the Germans had uh, committed uh, severe atrocities uh, throughout that war, killed millions of uh, Jewish people. Uh, the world knew it was wrong. Okay? Nobody disputed that unless they were uh, in a very tiny, tiny minority. But they knew there was something wrong. The problem they had is that at this point in history, there was something called positive law that had come about. Positive law didn't mean it's really good law. What it meant was you make a position to decide what the law is. To put it a different way, the law is decided by who's in charge. Okay, so if you have the power, you get to decide the laws. And that was the prevailing theory. That's, that's what everybody started to follow. We, there's not a natural law that we need to find. There's a positive law that we create. Right? But the problem with that is if that is true, then Germany did nothing wrong. Because they created the laws that said we can kill a million uh, Jewish people. But the world knows what? They know it's wrong. Okay, There's no getting around that. They know something has to be done. So what they would have used for, for years and years, they have to throw out the window and say, nope, it doesn't matter if Germany made those laws. We know natural law says, nope, it's not okay. And so they, they had the, what were called the Nuremberg Trials, and they brought all the, um, the, the people in the higher-ups of Germany to justice, okay? But if there's no standard of morality, if there's no right and wrong, then it shouldn't have been a problem, right? That was just what Germany thought was okay, right? Why, why was that? Why, why did they know they couldn't let that go? Because God's written his law in our hearts. C.S. Lewis put it this way, okay, guy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He said, a man does not uh, call a line crooked Unless he has an idea of what a straight line is. Okay? So understand, when you say, when you decide something is right or wrong, you are comparing it to a standard. And that standard is what we get from a creator. Because if there is no creator, there is no logical reason to have a standard of right and wrong. It should truly be what evolution says, that uh, it's survival of the fittest. But instinctively, we know that doesn't work. All right? Which, by the way, that would, that would bring us to the next point. Okay? And I don't have this on the slide, but I will add this in. There's a declaration of reality. In other words, when you choose to live apart from God's word, there comes a point where you do bump up against reality. And it doesn't work out very well. It may work out for a long time. It may work out for a short time. But you cannot go against God's word repeatedly for your entire life and not bump up against the reality of rejecting God's word. So the the evidence is, and this is just some of it. I didn't give it all to you because we'd be here for for days. Declaration of the universe, declaration of our world, declaration of morality. And so my favorite quote, or one of my favorite quotes is this. Would it not be strange if a universe without purpose accidentally created humans who are so obsessed with purpose? That was a guy named John Templeton from England. Very good. And one other thing I would say, uh, one of the uh, objections, I guess, to the idea of God is people will say, you know what, we, we learned about DNA. We learned about the cell. We learned about uh, the way the earth rotates around the sun. All right. Back in the day, people said it was God because they didn't understand how it worked. But now we understand how it works, so there must not be God. In fact, I, I saw this play out. When I was in college, uh, as I was going through my degree, one of the things we had to do was go to different high schools and observe different classes. And so one one morning, I found myself sitting in an English class in Tallahassee, Florida. 
And it was an English, the English teacher gets up and they were talking about mythology, Greek mythology, Roman mythology. And so she starts to talk about this very idea. And she says, you know, uh, Greek mythology didn't understand anything about the earth rotating around the sun. So they created the myth of Apollo. And the Romans didn't understand anything about lightning. So they created the myth of Zeus. All right. And so they go on and on. And then she, as an aside, says in the Christians... Uh, or actually they would have said uh, the, the ancient people didn't understand how the world came to be so they created the myth of a creator God All right? so it was that understanding the more we know we realize God doesn't need to be behind it but let me give you a verse that, that has always stuck with me you know how sometimes you hear something and it just sticks with you this is one of those things it's Proverbs 25 2 okay? it says it's the glory of God to conceal a matter but it's the glory of kings to search it out in other words, that's a gift from God. When, when we learn something about his creation, when we learn how it works, that doesn't mean there's no God. It means he's given us the gift of knowledge in that. All right? And in fact, as you discover what God has done and how he's created, it should give us a greater and greater wonder of who God is. All right? So we have no excuse. We know that there's God. And then the third one is this. The order in our world gives us confidence in God. All right, let's read verse 5 and 6. In the heavens he has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a groom coming from the bridal chamber. It rejoices like an athlete running a course. It rises from one end of the heavens and circles to the other. And nothing is hidden from its heat. All right. The order in our world is extremely important because Guys, what you need to understand is, in, go back to Genesis 1-2, or Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, but Genesis 1-2 tells us something important. It says, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the earth. In other words, there was complete chaos, there was nothing ordered, there was no creation, and God brought that out of nothing. Okay? So the order that we see in the world should point us toward God. In fact, uh, if you remember, we talked about, uh, you know, Bill Nye and Ken Ham having that debate and Bill Nye saying, you know what, if you're if you believe in God, you can't believe in science. You, you don't think that's um, there's a Greek word for that. OK, hogwash. <laughs> that's such an old preacher joke. And I always appreciate people laughing when, when, when we do something like that. Thank you. all I appreciate it. But guys, look, early science, when you go back to the 15, 1600s, early science was an attempt by Christians to find out about the order they believe God imposed upon the world. I'm going to bring you back to high school science. Does anybody remember the scientific method? No. <laughs> Some of you are like, no, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> scientific method is the way we do experimental science. It's the idea that I take a problem, I create a hypothesis, I gather the data, I interpret the data, I make my conclusion. Okay? A guy named Francis Bacon is the one who came up with that a long, long time ago. And his purpose in un trying to understand this was that he believed God created an order in the world and he believed that order would be borne out by you could do an experiment and the same thing would happen every single time if you did the experiment the same way every time. Because he believed there was a creator. He believed that creator imposed order upon this world and that that order could be known. So that's a start. You may have heard of a guy named Isaac Newton. We know who that is? Apple? Gravity? Okay. Isaac Newton was a Christian, and he believed his, his physics was born out of his belief that there was a God who created order in the universe. In fact, here's what Isaac Newton said. He said, the most beautiful system of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. So the father of physics believed that we could only look at the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the cosmos, and say, there must be a God. And then here's my favorite one. I think it's just because of his name, and I like to say his name. There's a guy named Aristosthenes. He lived in 240 B.C., all right, 20, 2,300 years ago. And 2,300 years ago, this guy was able to measure the circumference of the earth uh, by looking at the sun in relation to a well in Alexandria, Egypt, and another well 100 miles away along the Nile River. Okay? Here's why he did that. 500 years before, Isaiah, the prophet, uh, wrote a verse, wrote a curious verse. And here's what it said. God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like thin cloth and spreads them out like a tent to live in. All right. 
So he's going by what the Bible said to make his calculations, okay? Guys, early science was an attempt by believers in the Lord Jesus and believers in God to find out uh, what kind of order God had imposed on the world, all right? That's why we can do what we do, all right? There is a creator. He knows us. He loves us. Ancient cultures worshipped the sun. That, that verse is a beautiful picture, by the way, uh, of the sun every day coming up, going down. And we say the words coming up and going down, but we know it's because the earth is rotating around the sun. But it reminds us, what Romans one twenty five. we mistakenly worship sometimes what was created and not what, who created that thing. In fact, Jeremiah 33, 25, it says, This is what the Lord says. If I do not keep my covenant with the day and with the night and fail to establish the fixed order of the heavens and earth, then I might also reject the seed of Jacob and my servant David. In other words, because we have such order in this world, we can trust that God will do what he said he would do, that God will keep his promises. So here's the question. What does this mean for me? Why is this important? Why do I need to know this? Here's the first one. We have a creator, and we are accountable to him. If there is, in fact, God, and he is our creator, we are accountable to our creator. All right. Uh, Isaiah used the picture of uh, potter and the clay. In other words, God is the potter, we are the clay. We are in his hands. And so we are accountable to God. Too many of us live like God has no care about us. He doesn't worry about our lives. He doesn't worry about what we do. But we're accountable to a creator who loves us and wants what's best for us. And so if there's a creator, we are accountable to him. And our life matters, uh, not only to God, but it matters in this world. God has made himself known through nature. He has given us uh, the knowledge that, yes, we in fact do have a creator. Let's go back to that question about Jesus. What about those who have never heard of Jesus? I have two answers on that. The short one is this. Okay? We have uh, the understanding that there is God. And so if we reject God, then there's no need to go further because we've rejected the knowledge we have about God. But here's the second thing I would say. And this is what I would tell those students who ask that question about what about those who have never heard. Okay? What do we know about Almighty God? Is He love? Is He just? Is He righteous? If that is the case, then the short answer is I don't know exactly about those people, but I do trust that God is love, God is just, and God is righteous, and uh, he will uh, make a way and do what is right for them to hear. Okay? My longer answer is that we have so many documented cases uh, from time immemorial, especially as missionaries have started going out in, into all the world. We have so many cases Uh, of people who did accept that there was God, kind of like that guy with the cow in India, and then God might have come to him in a vision. They might have had a a dream that talked about it, but they they found a way to know about Christ. And I'll give you one of my favorite examples. Uh, Back in 1950s Soviet Union, uh, when the Soviet Union did everything they could uh, to remove the Bible from, from life, to remove any mention of God from life, and there was a young lady who was a, a poet, and uh, her name is beyond my ability to pronounce it, so just trust me, Russian poet. But she was sitting in school, and as she writes later, many years later, uh, she says, you know, every day they had a, a class on the, the merits of communism. And the teacher would say, how stupid you are to believe in God. Only old, old ladies who are about to die believe in God. And she thought to herself... If that's the case, um, why does she hate this God that she doesn't believe in? Because it was pretty obvious, okay? So she accepted that there was God. And then from there, through a turn of events in her life, she had an opportunity to hear about Christ. Okay? God will make a way. Okay? We have the opportunity to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read out of Isaiah 40:26. It says, "Who will you compare me to or who is my equal?" asked the holy one. "Look up and see who created these." He brings out the starry host by number. He calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. God knows the stars by name. He surely knows us by name. 
And he surely knows each person that he created by name. And I believe with all my heart that he will make a way. He will do what is right. He will do what is just. He will do what is love. But another question that we need to ask about that is this. What about you? Okay. You've heard. You don't have the excuse. You can't say, what, what about me? I've never heard about Christ. You've, you've heard about Christ. What has your decision been about Christ? Have you followed Christ? Have you accepted that free gift of salvation? Have you repented of sin? Have you uh, done what God made a way for you to do? That's the question today. Because you're not halfway around the world. You're sitting here and you know there's Christ. And you know there's a need for repentance. And you know there's a need for salvation. So my question today is, do you know Christ as Savior? Do you know there's a God? And as a fo- if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, my question would be, uh, do you now have confidence that, yes, there is a creator, that you have a, a way to show others that, yes, we do know there's God? I would encourage you so much to continue to read the rest of that Psalm 19 because it talks, the rest of that Psalm talks about special revelation. So as our praise team gets ready to come, let's pray. And uh, I pray uh, that you will let God speak to you and speak to your heart. So, Lord, we love you. I pray for anybody today uh, that needs to make that decision to follow you as Savior. Um, We just pray that you are almighty God, that you love us, uh, and that we would uh, have the courage to make that decision to follow you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for giving your life for us. Thank you for making a way for us to know you. Amen.